Orthodox Psychotherapy, Chapter 2, The Orthodox Therapist. So far, I hope we have established the truth that Christianity is mainly a therapeutic science. It is seeking the spiritual healing of man. Yet the right practice of medicine requires a good physician, a professional physician, and this applies to spiritual healing as well. There has to be a good doctor. He is the bishop and the priest. As we have noted before, people today feel that the priest's function is to enable them to take part in the holy sacraments. They feel that he has been commanded by God as his servant and deacon, so that they may confess their sins and have spiritual relief. They feel him to be the deacon of God, called to pray to him that their labors may be blessed, and so forth. Certainly, no one can deny that the priest will do such work as well. But usually, people seem to regard the priest rather as a magician, if I may be forgiven this expression. For when we look at the life of worship apart from curing, then rather it is magic. We repeat, however, in order to make it clear that the priest is properly a spiritual physician who cures people's sicknesses. Worship and sacraments must be placed within the therapeutic method and treatment. Even as a confessor, the priest is mainly a therapist. The sacrament of confession is not simply a formal absolution, especially of the Western type, as if God were angry and demanded expiation. It is something more. It is a part of the therapeutic treatment. There are numerous Christians who make confession over a period of many years but are not healed of their spiritual ills. Ignorance on the part of both the people and the pastors contributes to this. The task of the bishop, priest, or confessor is to lead the people out of Egypt into the promised land like another Moses. This guidance requires toil and labor, privation and anguish. It is mainly therapeutic supervision. The fathers are very insistent upon this truth. Let us take St. John of the Ladder as an example. He advises that those of us who wish to get away from Egypt and the Pharaoh need an intermediary with God to stand between praxis and theoria and stretch out his arms to God that those led by him may cross the sea of sin and put to flight the Amalek of the passions. The saint goes on to say that those who rely on their own powers and claim to have no need of a guide are deceiving themselves. From the Old Testament story, we know what Moses endured and how he guided that stiff-necked people. This spiritual Moses is a physician. Furthermore, all of us are sick and have need of therapy and the physician. St. Simeon, the new theologian, speaking to monks, makes this truth clear. As we know from the Orthodox tradition, the monasteries are properly hospitals. It would be better to claim that they are medical schools. As sick people, we are cured, and after that we learn how to cure. That is why the early church took priests from the monasteries, which are medical schools, to place them at the observation post of bishop. So in speaking to monks, St. Simeon did not hesitate to say that we are all poor and needy. He tells them how all of us who are in the cells are injured and affected by different illnesses. Therefore, we can do nothing but cry out day and night for the doctor of souls and bodies to heal our wounded hearts and give us spiritual health. The saint writes, And that is not all. Apart from being poor and naked, we lie pitifully wounded, affected with various illnesses. We move with difficulty in our cells or monasteries, as if in so many hospitals and homes for the aged. We cry out and groan and weep and call upon him who is the physician of souls and bodies, at least in so far as we are aware of the pain of our wounds and ailments. For there are those who do not even know that they have a disease or an ailment. That he should come and cure our wounded hearts and give health to our souls that lie in the bed of sin and death. For all of us have sinned, as the Holy Apostle said, and we have need of his mercy and grace. We have quoted this whole text 
because the mission of monasticism and the church, as well as the work of the pastors, is shown clearly. It is chiefly a therapeutic task. We are sick in the bed of sin and death. Any who do not sense this truth are mad. So the Christians who do not remain in the church in order to be healed or who feel that they are well are mad. According to St. Simeon, the new theologian, the priest is a physician. A person comes to the spiritual doctor ravaged with passion, his mind all distraught. The expert doctor, who is human and compassionate, understands his brother's weakness, the inflammation caused by the ailment, the tumor. He sees the sick person wholly in the power of death. Then the saint describes the way in which the spiritual and expert physician approaches the sickness and how it is to be cured. We have previously mentioned two basic images which characterize the pastor's work, that he is a Moses who leads his spiritual children, and he is at the same time both a scientist and a sympathetic physician. Both these qualities are contained in one of St. Simeon's poems describing his own healing by his spiritual father, his personal Moses. He applies to his life the journey of the Israelite people and the guidance by Moses. He writes, He came down and found me to be a slave and a stranger, and he said, Come, my child, I will take you towards God. He asked his Moses for assurances that he could do such a thing. He brought me close, he clasped me tight, and again he kissed me with a holy kiss, and there was a scent of immortality all about him. I believed, I loved to go with him, and I longed to serve him alone. He took me by the hand and walked before me, and in this way we began to travel the road. And after a long journey in which, through the interventions of his spiritual father, he has succeeded in confronting the passions and being freed from slavery to them, St. Simeon begs his spiritual father, Come, I said, my lord, I will not part from you. I will not disobey your commands, but will keep them all. However, in order for a person to be an orthodox therapist and cure the spiritual ills of his spiritual children, he himself must previously have been healed as far as possible. He must stand in the middle between praxis and theoria. How can one heal without having previously been healed or without having tasted the beginning of healing? Therefore, St. Simeon accuses those who regard themselves as spiritual directors before being imbued with the Holy Spirit, rashly receiving others' confessions and daring to rule monasteries or occupy the positions of authority, pushing themselves forward shamelessly by a thousand intrigues to be made metropolitans or bishops to guide the Lord's people before they have seen the bridegroom in the bridal chamber and become sons of the light and sons of the day. All this has been put matchlessly by St. Gregory the Theologian who writes, It is necessary first to be purified, then to purify, to be made wise, then to make wise, to become light, then to enlighten, to approach God, then to bring others to him, to be sanctified, then to sanctify. St. John Chrysostom, who has been hailed as an expert on the priesthood, writes in a famous passage in which he seeks to justify his refusal to be made a bishop, that he is aware of the weakness and smallness of his soul, as well as the importance and difficulty of guiding the people. I know how weak and puny my own soul is. I know the importance of that ministry and the great difficulty of it. In his discussion with St. Basil, he asks him to have no doubt about what he has said, that while he loves Christ, he is afraid of provoking scandal by taking up the spiritual ministry, since the infirmity of my spirit makes me unfit for this ministry. The great purity of his thoughts and feelings caused him to feel that the weakness of his soul made him unfit for this great ministry. For indeed, as will be observed later, unhealed passions prevent a priest from helping to heal his spiritual children. 
If the therapist has not previously been cured, he is commonplace. They simply take commonplace men and put them in charge of those things. All these things to which we have already referred point to the great truth that the priests who wish to cure the illnesses of the people must themselves have previously been cured of these illnesses or at least have begun to be cured and must feel the value and possibility of healing. What is to follow will also be placed in this context. We should make it clear that we are not planning to look at the whole spectrum of the priesthood or the role of priests. It is not our purpose to explain the value and importance of the priesthood, but to look at this great and responsible office from the point of view that it is a therapeutic science whose main work is to cure men. If at some points we seem to be trying to underline the value of the priesthood, we do it solely in order to look at this side which we wish to emphasize here.